So as we're watching the uh, change of the guard ceremony, the clock strikes 11, and uh, it made me think of something. You know, the importance of veterans telling our stories is there are 400,000 graves or more out here in Arlington that tell us that veterans need to tell their stories to prevent 400,000 or even one more grave in the cemetery. And as our country is in its 11th hour, at a very critical time, it's important for us and our generation to tell the next generation our stories and our experience. You know, not only to encourage them to take pride in their country, but also to hopefully prevent this rush and rash, you know, entry into wars. Uh, for whatever reason, whether just or unjust, because this, I mean, this is the true cost of war. War is hell. But it can also be a hell of a good time. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to win the hearts and minds of the people that are trying to blow us up every day. We're in the airport and we're going to be leaving, I don't know when. We're stopping in Hungary from Indianapolis and going to Iraq or actually Kuwait. It's going to be fine. So for years, I just had this burden. I've got these, you know, mini DV cassette tapes. Uh, it's what we used to film everything on back when it was uh, videotape. And uh, I had everything on these tapes and I just had this box of them for years. And I just thought, I wanna do something with this. I wanna turn it into something. I want people to see some of the stuff that we did because the DVDs that we made have gotten degraded over the years and the quality's not great. And there's not a lot of continuity. I mean, there's a lot of funny stuff jammed in each DVD, but there wasn't really a story necessarily. I really wanted to frame it up and tell a story. And this project was kind of born out of that. Uh, it's been 10 years since I've seen some of the guys that I literally would have given my life for 10 years ago. And I thought there's an obscenity in that. I really think that we need to reconnect with these guys and that we need to stay in touch. And so that's been my mission for this project, you know, outside of getting footage and interviewing, you know, these guys for this film, it's really been about reconnecting these old friendships, reconnecting these dots, these missing places in my life. Because if I'm being perfectly honest, I can't make lifelong friends ever again that were like those friends. Because there aren't other people in my life that have been through those things. You know, in my experience, you know, I'm thankful because I've got, you know, this good friendship with Daniel that we've maintained over the years. My brother and I served together, and that's one of the things I'm the most proudest of 
is that I served with my little brother in the same unit, in the same conflict. And so all this kind of together made me just know that I had to facilitate this to tell this story. And the hope is, is that we continue to stay in touch. These relationships, this healing, this bonding that's been happening through the process of this film, hopefully is something that will not end with this film. It'll be ongoing from here forward because I know just speaking for myself, I need it. And of the guys we've talked to, everyone has, has agreed that it's just something that we need because the friendships we made were real friendships. Stan and I were in Alpha Battery 5th and 113. That's our unit. And he was basically the class clown, so to speak. Our cheerleader, our entertainment, our morale booster, and one hell of a dancer. And he somehow had this charisma about him to where he could rally people around this cause, and the cause was making people laugh, doing these funny videos, um, making sure we get everything on film. And in the middle of the crap storm we were in, uh, we had fun. Uh, you know, not every deployment is what you see on TV. Ours was freaking hilarious. Lake actually made it easier for us. He actually broke up the monotony of stressful days. But Lake would go there and he would make your day easier, make your day better. You could have a crappy day, hear something bad from home, and he would come up there and literally hurt himself like jackass and make, him, make you feel better to a point because he didn't care. I mean, he wanted you to be better, be happier. There was a time and place to be serious, but the whole time didn't have to be serious. Yeah. Like, I wanted to retain some aspect of humanity. Mm -hmm. And that was my little way of like, hey guys, like, newsflash, like, we're still humans. Like, we're not, you know, we're not these programmed robots. Uh, so I'm gonna dance a little. <laughs> you guys, I never saw anything inappropriate, and I understood you guys were under a lot of stress and pressure, and it was a stress relief for you guys. My name's Stan Lake. And I'm testing out the durability of a military uh, IBA. Uh, we're going to see what kind of brutal abuse it can withstand. <laughs> I didn't feel a thing, thanks to my military Kevlar. We were just a bunch of goofballs. We just got stuck into a wartime situation. And we had to freaking play the part. But, you know, a lot of us took it. Uh, we accepted our position, and we ran with it. I say it really helped. Uh, kind of pull some of the seriousness out of the situation, really helped us kind of relax, enjoy ourselves, have a really good time, laugh a little bit, you know. Um, we didn't have cable TV, we didn't have things like that, so that was absolutely awesome. Um, I think the brass hated it, um, in all honesty. Sometimes it was our goal to see what they would let us get away with, and uh, just watching their reactions to some of the things we did was hilarious. Gunny's the best convoy commander ever. He's really hot outside today, so I'm gonna try to cool him off. <laughs> now this is the funny part, because we get to see him push. <laughs> one! One! One foot! Four, Four sorry! I think they wanted us to be a little more serious, you know, like, oh, you guys are serious soldiers and stuff like that. But I think they kind of had to let it go because it wasn't anything completely over the top and stupid or dangerous. Um, and it was great for morale. Mountain goats during mating season will fight by head buddy, sometimes to the death. But this has nothing to do with mountain goats. This is all about stupid people. We're testing out the durability of military duct tape once again on my eyebrows. This is unibrow removal. Go. <laughs> I successfully removed about 10 hairs. Uh, I think of all the videos that you guys made and then we'd watch them in our, in our bay. I, I remember laughing at a lot of stuff. Uh, I mean, I remember we'd come back from missions and you know, we'd watch all uh, the stuff that you guys were shooting. My name is Butler, and I'm gonna knock the poopy out of Lake with this cot. My name is Lake, and I'm gonna get the poopy knocked out of me with the cot. You know, when we were making the videos over there, you know, it was it was great because it broke the monotony of of what we were going through, you know, and a whole bunch of shenanigans going on, and it made me laugh. You know, it was all about 
It was all about making, making people laugh and, uh, and uh, sharing that, that good experience, not just the bad. During this process of filming, you know, where our friends are now and, and kind of reconnecting with all these people, you know, it's been great on the sense of like seeing a lot of these guys again, seeing a lot of the, the people that literally like I'm willing, was willing and still am willing to die for. Like it was great to see them again. But on the flip side, it's been uh, for me as a filmmaker and as, as a person that's still dealing with issues from Iraq, uh, it's been an emotional roller coaster. Uh, this has been the hardest thing I've ever had to do to tell this story. Living through these experiences has lived with me. Uh, and it's been an interesting journey. And to be honest with you, I've just tried to forget a lot of it. I've tried to forget about it. And to a lesser degree, I think sometimes that's why a lot of us haven't reconnected. Because in reconnecting with them, I've, I've reopened old wounds. I was angry. I mean, just pissed off. You know, anything set me off. My transition back into civilian life was not easy. Not at all. Went from making really good money to making okay. And uh, from there it all fell apart. I'm a very nice guy, but when I'm angry, I'm just super angry. And uh, trying, to, trying to cope through that, and I haven't really gotten any real help with it yet. And uh, something that actually doing this documentary has kind of opened my eyes that, hey, you know, these guys had that same problem, or some of those same problems. Maybe you need some help too. You know, maybe it's time to say, "All right, I'll quit being proud about it, and I'll just get it done." And uh, it's been kind of an eye opener. And uh, so hopefully, I won't be punching through any doors or anything when I'm slightly angry anymore. Shove ten pounds of shit in a bottle of this size. I mean, eventually it's going to fill up, and it ain't going to take them. The biggest reintegration was at the house. Um, my wife and daughter still joke that they're not soldiers not, you know, run in the house like they're soldiers, and that was really tough. And that short temper that I kind of talked about while we were deployed kind of carried back into home. For a long time, I, I shut myself off. Still stayed in the Guard and uh, worked for the state's training team. And after a while, you just, the anger, you was pretty pissed off. And then things would set you off. So, uh, like I said, my wife split up and I started going to, to the VA. Uh, they got me into PTSD. Started going to see a, a therapist first, and I didn't like that. I didn't feel like they paid attention to what you were saying. They were too busy typing. But I got into a group, and that was been almost five years ago. And they were really good. It's, you know, the guys really able to help you. And uh, maybe you don't have nothing to say or nothing, but you listen to them, and hey, that sounds like me, and maybe I'll give that a try. It's hard to talk about because she was always there, and I wouldn't let her in. My transition back into civilian life, being a soldier in a combat zone, being thrust back into civilian life, for me, was challenging. You know, I went, I went from being like somebody doing something important back to a nobody in a small town. It was kind of hard because you do build friendships with people and you get really close to them, and then those friends go away and you have to come back to your normal family. And that's, that's real, that was really hard for me because you couldn't joke around with your family members like you could with the people overseas. And because the people overseas, your friends, they don't judge you like your, your family does. And for me, that was one of the hardest things. It's been hell for me. Yeah. And it's been hell on her, it's been hell on our kids early on. I mean, they finally got to a point where they just, you know, my daughter didn't come back when we got home. She stayed with her mom. I left high school went to training, come home from training for one week, I, I volunteered and I got picked up from the unit. So I really had no time as an adult. And I come home almost 21. I was four months away from being 21. So I had no more family around. I had my mother around. I, I had nothing that, I've lived with these guys for this whole year and a half. Pretty much, we was together for almost 18 months together. And now I'm by myself. It was, it's, a, it was, it's a scary thing. So I'm not the only one. I find out that I'm, I'm not the only one that's, that's, that's feeling that, you know, that uh, feels like, hey, we were doing good. You know, we were doing some, some really good things there. And now you're back to being average Joe, you know? Everybody wants to be average Joe. Everybody wants to be, you know, spectacular. They want to be, you know, the best that they can be, be all they can be. That's why they join the Army. 
you know, you're already having to readjust to civilian life and, and not being in the military or not being in, you know, immersed day to day in it, you know, and then you know, find a job on top of that and stuff, you know, it's, it's not, it's not something that uh, I, I would have looked forward to. So I'm, I'm glad that I was able to just, you know, come home and have a job. It was tough. I think I didn't sleep very well the whole first year I was back. Um, I'd wake up not out of a nightmare or anything, but I'd wake up thinking I was in Iraq. You know, I'd wake up and, or my wife would get up out of the bed in the middle of the night and I would jump, you know, like I was going to jump on her or something like that. I don't know why. I think it was just, my body's just trying to decompress from all the stress of being over there and being on active duty and whatnot. And so um, it was hard. Um, and also being away from guys I was used to being around every day and having to get used to being back to people who weren't over there, who didn't understand what we'd been through, who were asking me questions but really didn't care to hear the answers, uh, what I had to say, and uh, who couldn't relate to what I'd been through and what we had been through. I had to leave my family, walk away, go do a job, at the risk of losing my life or life of my comrades, I'm having to deal with that, live with that, and some things that we were asked to do, and, uh, and all the things that we had to do, and things we got involved in, that, that kind of changes a person's life. It made my transition back into civilian life hard because I no longer had a mission. You know, what is my purpose? What is my mission? And I still struggle with that today. I still struggle with uh, not knowing my place in the world without having this bigger picture mission to go on. When you go to war, um, a lot of stuff happens and you don't completely ever come home, I think. And, uh, and some of us never come home, you know, or only part of them comes home. And um, you get put into these fight or flight situations that you may never have been put in before, the life or death situations. And you never completely, as a person, come back from that. It's, it's hard. And then when you get back home, you got to rediscover who you are on this side of reality. Best advice I can give you. If somebody says, I'm here, I'm listening, open up and spill your guts. Don't hold nothing back. It's not worth it. Anytime somebody knows we're a veteran or been overseas, they always ask what it's like. And it's not really a simple, a simple answer to that question. Find anything up there? Ooh, you. Find anything up there? Hey, hey. hey uh, what are you wearing? Sun. Sun. Why don't you just, they're selling hats over there telling our story through documentary or through interview, I think gets it out a lot more clear to where the average civilian can under, better understand what it really was like. Uh, we're testing out the militaries. Ah! <laughs> we're testing out the militaries. Uh, Don't forget Patterson. Patterson. I'm here with Sean Patterson, my boy, my counterpart. Uh, <laughs> Between me and you, I sound funny, but I miss it. You know, one thing about being in a combat zone that's understood but maybe not communicated is that whether you're in direct a direct firefight or you're you're in route on a convoy, you're living in this ever-present danger. You're living in this scenario that at any moment. You know, a piece of trash on the side of the road, a, a, a dead cat, you know, that you've passed, a pothole, could all end your life. You know, a, a sniper could fire down from uh, one of the buildings as you pass through a crowded town, or, you know, a roadside bomb in one of these uh, roadside craters that are everywhere in Iraq. Uh, and living in that perpetual state of, you know, impending doom, it just does something to you that's psychological, that's hard to uh, quantify. So, Link, what exactly is the purpose of the uh, tinfoil on your Kevlar? So the Army can't know, know my thoughts and how much I hate them. Is it working so far? I don't know, because I haven't had any thoughts yet. And then, you know, sometimes you get shot at, and sometimes things blow up, and 
Sometimes trucks break down, sometimes they crash, you know. She knew something happened because the first thing I said was, I love you. I never started a conversation with that. We tried to say, no, we don't need to go. And then we ended up getting hit. I mean, nobody got hurt. That was an interesting mission. Yeah. Sergeant Folk's truck, that's the one that got, he got hit on that. Luckily, he just shook him up a little bit. And she goes, oh my God, what happened? She knew. She knew right then that I'd been hit or hurt. Well, my, my deployments have affected my life in several ways. I have PTSD, night terrors. And, uh, I'm not a very sociable person. I suck at relationships. Pretty good at sucking at relationships. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm more cautious about what I do and who I hang out with. Um, I, I've made my social circle very small and uh, that's pretty much how it's affected me. So I was a very unique park ranger in that I wasn't a park ranger at all. I'm a 31 Bravo, which means a military police officer. I'm coming through Operation Guardian. It's a subsidiary of Operation Warfighters where they take wounded soldiers and they place them in government entities. I was the first of a pilot program here at NAMA, National Mall Memorial Parks. Uh, I was hit by a suicide bomber on October 1st of 2012, so roughly about three years ago. Um, so it's, it's getting very close to my, what we like to call a live day. So you'll see me walk with a little bit of a limp. That's why. You know, it's, um, it just seemed like we're just going on and on forever. Uh, we went everywhere. I can't remember where all we went. I have a journal I wrote all that down in, but I just thought we would never, ever get back. And just remember feeling dirty, tired, and just, just feeling like awful. <laughs> I don't think you'll ever forget you know, IEDs going off, motor rounds coming in, um, rounds being fired, uh, things like that. Uh, they, you know, they might lessen over time, but they don't ever go away. Um, so you might not deal with them every night, but every now and then it might be something that kind of flashes through your mind. For me, I work third shift. So I'm on the highway late at night and that's when we drove overseas. So, you know, not every day, but you know, every now and then I just get this feeling of being uncomfortable. I get this feeling of being ultra alert while I'm driving down the highway. You know, I don't have any illusions in my mind that an IED is gonna like go off and blow me up or anything. But uh, I mean, it still kind of sticks with me. It still kind of makes me uncomfortable um, sometimes in that sense. Um, find myself maybe scanning a little more, kind of paying attention to some things a little more. So it's the only combo commander to lose a truck like that. I mean, I lost a green truck and one white truck or a civilian truck. Um, green truck, it's uh, <clears throat> I think about it, you know, I remember going to the, the bumper number, whether it's 316, can't, can't remember what the bumper number was, the admin number for that for that truck, but say if it was 316, I remember going out to the motor pool, so they had the line, and, and each of them had their own, you know, uh, wooden block with their number on it. I remember going out there and looking, when we got back to Eric John, looking down and seeing that 316 ain't there. That whole, that spot was at, it ain't there. It ain't coming back. We um. In our 180th Battalion, we was actually attached with uh, five other units. 243rd was one of the units we was attached to. I do remember the time we, we come by and they got, they didn't get hit with the IED or nothing. Some truck drivers messed up and I remember seeing these guys burn to death. And that was probably the lowest point I had in the whole deployment. Because even though it wasn't my, one, of, one of my guys in my unit, none of my brothers, it was somebody in my battalion that I had to deal with. We had to deal with 243rd on a daily basis. They was, the next Paris right beside us. So that was probably the lowest point. Small and Wiseman, their truck getting uh, getting hit, and actually, you know, other people have been hit, but their truck actually burning to the ground. And, um, you know, hearing about all the other issues, you know, other people losing their lives, wrecks, people getting hurt, stuff like that. I mean, it does kind of mentally drag you down a little bit, but at the same point in time, um, you have that, that tempo where you couldn't really slow down. I mean, Small and Wiseman, their truck burned down to the ground and they're like, hey, can we hang out back here on base for a few days and not do anything? Can we relax? We need to we need to unwind a little bit. You know, this just happened. No, get right back out there. Living in that danger every day, not knowing if today is your last day. Like we have the same odds of dying here in America, theoretically. I mean, if it's your time, it's your time. But over there, that that is intensified, it's heightened, that sense of awareness of your own mortality. Uh, I saw things over there that I will never forget. You know, I saw things that haunt my dreams to this day. Uh, I had experiences that uh, 
that I'll never forget. The importance of the videos to me was just getting our minds off of being at war. Y'all ain't work? Just take Oh uh, yeah, you rest time? Yes. I don't think there is rest time around here. You know what? All four of you guys are fired. Yeah. I'll never want to see you back here again. Any of y'all smile? Smile, come on. Smile for me. <laughs> there you go, you got the smile. I can't even see your face. Alright guys, y'all have a good one. Just don't come back and walk through the fire. Alright? You know, a lot of us were kids over there. First time away from our families. And just having something to do to take our minds off of that. That stress of just being away. And, uh, the stress, <clears throat> the stress of thinking that you know we could die today and never make it back home. I don't have a, a particular mission that stands out, but I have so many things within those missions that stand out. You know, just funny stuff that happened. I stole Lake's towel out of the shower, and uh, I stole every towel in the damn shower, and all. And uh, the only thing he had was paper towels to walk back to the tent in, and it was like a quarter mile walk to the tent. So what we're going to do is we're going to go take his clothes while he's in the shower. He's going to have to walk about 50 meters buck naked back to the tent. It's going to be hilarious. And I'm having to walk back to the, the uh, barracks with this very tiny towel that would barely squeeze around me as it's trying to squeeze around him. And he just walks in just laughing. Blake, where's the clothes at? Closer on my bunk the whole time, apparently, somebody stole them. And uh, that was kind of my crowning achievement there. I thought it was hilarious, and, and uh, I got a big kick out of that. I remember that a lot. I mean, I went, to, I went to Iraq when I was 20 years old. It turned 21 in Fallujah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the whole experience definitely shapes who I am today. You know, you're, you're talking less than 1% of the nation's population that once served. And then, of the ones that have served, how many, how many have, have gone overseas and fought in you know, wartime you know, conflict? Um, it's important for them to tell a story. Um, because they're fighting for the freedoms of folks back, back here at, at home. And uh, the things they go through is, uh, is uh, pretty extraordinary, I think. It changed me as a person, as far as a leader, as far as a person in, in, in general. So, um, It's important that the public understands the, the truth of who we are, the impacts, the sacrifices, the um, the you know the tough times, the good times that we that we've gone through uh, during our deployment, and, um, and so they, they need to know. It's to educate the public, educate folks so they know what the government does, what it means when the government sends soldiers overseas, the impact it has on people. Within the fact that you're already kind of a rock star, that you're a soldier anyway, you know, a combat soldier of that. You add to that the fact that you're in, the, in, you know, in having fun, you know, making videos. You got something that, you know, when your kids are old enough to understand lots of cuss words, that you can show them, you know, in the future. Hey, this was your dad back in the day. So, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was a cool experience. It's something I wouldn't trade anything for. I think it's important for veterans to tell their stories because, you know, the average person doesn't really understand, you know, that. Being in the military is like a lifestyle. You know, it's a, it's not something that you just uh, you go and do casually. You know, you, you you really have to you know have your mind framed a certain way to 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 do the things and you know know that you're leaving your family, you may not come home, and things like that. So.
I think it's good for you know, the average person to, to see that and you know, hear it firsthand. Well, I feel the, the topic of like service in Iraq has kind of been like covered. I mean, everybody knows you, you pack up, you go over there, you're given a job and you do it. Um, I think the interesting um, side of the story is the guard aspect of it. So, you know, with the National Guard, unlike active duty, I mean, we're given a job just like they are. But when we're told to go overseas a little more so than them, we're retrained and we're given a different job. So, I mean, again, we fired rockets. That's what we did. And then, OK, you're going to Iraq, but you're going to be a truck driver. So the next generation, I hope they understand that uh, the true cost of war and what it what it means to go to war and to give up everything for the, your love of the country. And so to love one another and um, I hope I hope the war that we fought in, in Iraq and Afghanistan wasn't wasn't in vain. Being over there was just part of the deal. I mean, that's just what I signed up for. So it wasn't that. It wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, um, opportunity that maybe I was going to get shot or killed. That wasn't that really wasn't the biggest deal. I mean, it was one of them things where I just knew, well, if it's my time, it's my time. I'm going to go. Not everybody is aware of what went on at, when people were deployed or what's going on after them in any way that we can talk about veterans, not about us specifically, but just the general veteran story to educate people to, to understand that there's challenges that all veterans in some degree or form face is, is a good thing. Yeah, don't, don't join the military for the wrong reasons. If you want to go to school, go to school. If you want to go in the military, go in the military. Don't mix the two up, because it'll screw you up every time. I don't wear the uniform anymore, but to my heart, I don't see the guys anymore, but they're in my heart. They're in my memories. And that's the thing that's, that's been the worst. Really, I could say transition, you know, it, it was a little difficult, you know, a little difficult. But, you know, that's a sacrifice you have to make. You know, a choice everybody makes when you become a soldier. You know, that you're asked to do things and go places and, you know, things that you normally wouldn't do in life, you know, but it, ta it takes, it takes a good heart to do it. You know, you, ha you have to have the heart for it. Uh, for me, it was a little odd. And a lot of times I felt kind of like isolated because the way we deployed, it's not like I knew any of the other company commanders. And, it, and I mean, I had my lieutenants, but you know, there was a little distance between them. But I did get a good relationship with, as, you know, different levels of relationships with the enlisted folks. Uh, the senior NCOs and the officers. And the officers, I think by the end of the year, were tired of me because I'd make them come to dinner with me at least uh, once a month for some learning event and stuff. But I still talk to those guys and I enjoy, you know, even though our relationship is different levels with, you know, you and your guys and because you guys were a little closer all the time, I think that a lot of people made some definitely good strong bonds and I, I'm just glad that worked out. You know. You know, you can put a group of people anywhere, have them doing anything, and if they're just doing the job at hand, I mean, and they get it done, that's okay. But when you add shenanigans and you add other stuff and you talk about family, it pretty much brings everybody together and you have a tighter bond. I feel like uh, we did a great mission. We supported, I don't know how many companies moving in, transitioning in and out of country. We moved a lot of stuff. Um, we supported the Marines, we supported the Air Force, we supported the Army. We supported all kinds of folks, and so I feel like we were actually a very valuable asset over there. You know, having studied military history and and looking at um, different units and operation, different conflicts, really, I'd say our job was one of the most important jobs in Iraqi freedom because um, somebody had to move all that gear, somebody had to you know co uh, connect these units back and forth, and, and that was us. 
I feel like we were really a crucial part of what was going on over there. No, we weren't the guys kicking in doors and nabbing terrorists, but we were the guys that were allowing that to happen, basically. So I think uh, our role was very important. And I think ultimately uh, we did a great job at it. You know, Captain Coleman had made a comment at the beginning that he had told his commander that we were going to be the best unit over there in our battalion. I think he was right. I think in the end that's what we were. <laughs> we had a good time. You know, there, there, was, there was a lot a lot of problems I had with, with the overall mission of, of the war in Iraq and things like that. But but day to day we had a good time. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just the kind of bond you have with the with the guys is just there's nothing like that between that deployment and my second deployment uh it's some of my closest friends uh you know and i often have students now that are that are thinking about joining the military and i never know what to tell them um i feel like i had a good experience but also also am always cautious about encouraging kids to join the military because you, you're so young and you don't know what you're signing up for and you don't know what you're going to get thrown into. I was 17 when I joined. I think originally when I joined the National Guard, it was, I was assumed that it was just a one weekend a month and you weren't going to do nothing and um, two weekends out the year, two weeks out the year and you just kind of just, you know, do whatever. Um, but when that deployment time came, it, stuff just got real. Over two million miles we put down the range through Iraq and Kuwait. And it's pretty outstanding to say that we could do, you know, not only, you know, fill the boots of active duty, but, you know, go past what they could do. No, it was actually outstanding. Okay, yeah, we may be National Guard in name, but we do the same thing as, as regular Army. If we can deploy like the regular Army, then we're just as, as good as they are. Um, I just think that the National Guard doesn't afford us the opportunity to train like the regular Army, but we do the same thing. If we can, if we can just fight just as well as they can in the regular Army, then that's who we are. We just got a different name. So, uh, like, what do you think about this, you know, appointment all? We're fixing to go home. Man, we've been gone from home forever. I'm so ready to go home. <laughs> Ow. War's always the last option, if, you know, if, if, if possible. But it's not always possible, so. Somebody's got to do the job, though, so. Why not you? <laughs> then, like, you know, working at McDonald's, you don't show up. You know, the burger guy's got to reach over here and flip over, the you know, the french fries, too. Uh, this is a different thing, you know, hey, if you're not there, in my mind's eye, if, you, if you're not there, then, you know, something, something could, you know, happen to your friends, you know? You guys become your family. I could not talk to these guys for years, reconnect in one phone call and pick up exactly where we left off. You know, we, we went over there to do a job, we done our job, and I, and I think we helped the Iraqis to a degree. We learned to cope with each other, deal with each other's faults. I think all together it was a great experience. It's not all bad. It's not all this crazy experience. Like there's a lot of good that happens in war. Now you probably didn't hear about this in the news media uh, very often because it was a positive story. But I remember that they we had made it safe enough in certain places where kids for the first time could go to school. And instead of begging for food and water, as was their custom when we'd come through on convoys, these cute little kids in school uniforms with little backpacks, I'm talking five, six-year-old kids, marching in single file down these roads, started begging our convoys for pens and paper. That was life-changing for me. It was, it, was, it was reaffirmation that, listen, whether you agree with the war, there is good being done. Those are the things I like to remember. Those are the things that make me feel like everything that we did over there wasn't for a loss. It wasn't for, for nothing. Uh, there was good that happened, and you know I, I don't care who says it. Like whether we went there for the right or wrong reason, we did good while we were there. Community we made, like I said, it's it's a it's a brotherhood and a family that everybody has together now. Um, I know any of the guys that in this room with me or anybody that's deployed with me could call me and I would be there because I know how bad it is. Nobody's gonna call you out of nowhere for nothing. And if they call me today, hey man, I need some help, I need to bail out, I need something like this, I'd be there for them because we're, we're brothers, we're family now. We're no longer just friends. What we did spoke volumes because there were active duty units in our battalion that weren't performing at the level we were. More than anything, I just remember there was a different feeling being a soldier in Iraq than I have ever felt anywhere else in my life. I felt more alive 
than I've ever felt, you know, since. And that was the defining moment whenever I actually came to grips with who I was. We made the best of what we had, and we really did. We came together as a team, as a family, and we made it the best deployment that we could make it. There is not one thing I would change at all. I don't regret anything that happened to me, any situation that I put myself in or that was created around me. I would not change one day. Everyone's experience was different. This was my experience. You know, we all participated in this war, but everyone fought a different war. Uh, and a lot of us, the war started when we got home. When the buses carrying 160 National Guardsmen just back from Iraq came to a stop, the emotions poured. These men were gone for 15 months. It's so good to have you home. Now families can relax. We can finally start watching the news again. <laughs> and fall back into more familiar brotherly roles. Our schedules were mixed up, so we really didn't have much time between to see each other. It's kind of a good thing. It was a mixed blessing because uh, <laughs> I didn't really want to see him. <laughs> One thing we've learned through this process is that the, uh, the Army did a very good job of training us to go overseas and do a job. But what it didn't do such a great job at was uh, training us to come home and get back into regular society. You know, being in the National Guard on top of it, you're a civilian one day. Daniel and I were college students when we got mobilized. The next day you're in a combat zone, essentially, or in full-time military activity. And then it's almost like you're dumped off at the very end and you're just a civilian again with no purpose, mission, or obligation. And it, it's surprising how quickly you kind of spiral into these dark places. I know that uh, one thing that was unique about our relationship is that we were together pretty much, you know, the, the majority of our, seas, our overseas tour, but once we got home, we actually stayed in touch. We were roommates for a while, we, you know, we kept on filming uh, stuff like this, the other documentaries and things, and uh, it was, you know, we were definitely a lifeline to each other, I felt, like, in a very big way through these last 10 years, and I honestly don't know that I'd be, you know, the person I am, you know, without my battle buddy. And that's the thing, like, I want to encourage you as a viewer, if you've served, if you're a veteran yourself, check on your buddy. Undoubtedly, you've still got a battle buddy, and if you don't, you know others that have served that you share a similar story with. Now, if you're a veteran, you know, reach out to fellow veterans. You know, if you still are in contact with your battle buddy, reach out to your battle buddy. If you're not in contact for whatever reason with your battle buddy or someone you served with, Reach out to any veteran because undoubtedly we all share a similar story and we can understand somewhat the places we've all been, at least in essence. Um, it's, it's important and it's imperative to check on your buddies. It's actually just as important stateside as it was in Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever you may have went because, you know, we, we came back, we came with, back with every soldier we left with, but, you know, statistics show us, I think right now it's like 22 soldiers kill themselves every day. It's that, you know, being alone, not having a mission anymore. You know, you could be, you could be the lifeline to, you know, your battle buddy. So listen, I'm challenging you today with a new mission. Your mission moving forward is to find your battle buddies, to find people that have served and encourage them. Find out about local veteran organizations and things and ways that you can help your community as a veteran to enrich your community for veterans and everyone else as well. Everyone in this city needs to be throat punched and pushed off their trikes. There's a sign that says live by the bomb and die by the bomb. I'm kind of a fan of the bomb because one of them is called Fat Boy. <laughs> and I'm the Fat Boy. I just thought being the bomb was like a good thing. When did being the bomb be bad? When I, when I met Daniel, I said, were your parents terrorists? Because you the bomb. That's right. <laughs> I thought you the bomb. <laughs> Dom wants to eat the camera. <laughs> I don't even speak Spanish. <laughs> well, that's what my life has been for seven years. Can you look into the camera again and just say your name? <laughs> yeah, just like that. <laughs>
things are supposed to stop a bullet from a 7.62, which is an AK-47. I'm going to see if it'll stop a foot size. What size shoe do you wear? Yeah. I'm going to see if it'll stop a 10 and a half and about six feet drop. Let's do this. It stopped it. It worked. No pain. Monster rapping right now. Right, just really on, loud. Stop. <laughs> Let's be serious for a second. Or moderately serious. Three, two. What's up, everybody? We made it to DC. We had a great day today. Uh, we got to go around town and see a bunch of things that we wouldn't have otherwise seen, thanks to James. And uh, you know, we're right behind us is the White House, which is where the most powerful man in the country stays. They say, at one point in the War of 1812, George Washington lashed his horse to this post. The more you know. Duck face, peace out. <laughs> Sometimes I think when I do these videos that the camera adds 10 pounds, but Daniel reassures me. Uh, I think he ate a bag of cameras. <laughs> That's my excuse <laughs> for gaining weight post-military. What's up, y'all? I'm on the mountain doing cookie plan. <laughs> they didn't have any uh, Krispy Kremes in Iraq, I don't think. Nah, but they had Baskin Robbins and some of the chow haws and your boy gained some weight. <laughs> and one day it just started raining. There was sideways rain, there was upside down rain, there was over the top of my head rain, there was all kinds of rain. Now it's amazing to me to think that like they have the power to send us to war, to send us into conflict and other things, and they've got a lot of weight and burden on their shoulders that we have no idea about. And I'm thankful whether I agree or disagree, I'm thankful that uh, we made it out alive from the conflict that we were in, and I'm hoping that for future generations that, you know, we're not having to do this perpetually forever like we did in Vietnam and, and how this war is turning into, um, you know, but getting off my soapbox. Glad we made it back. The friendship kind of take us all over the world and back to where it all started because because of someone's initiative in this building, it sent us to war, and, and here we are today. I just think it needs shutters because it looked a little plain. Whatever was between you, Dari, and. That's why I'm the cameraman. <laughs> Remember to spay and neuter your pets. <laughs> Remember to spay and neuter your friends if they're like this guy. Shut <laughs> the damn cameras up. <laughs>